take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. Yeah! The Rock Bell Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Now, here's your host, Radical Ross. Good day, tokers and tokettes and non-toking lovers at Liberty. It is Wednesday, November 5th, 2014, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. And we have got to have double the number of legal marijuana states today. It is a huge victory lap day for everyone in the drug law reform movement with most of our elections coming out as victories and the ones that weren't still have lots of silver linings in them. We're going to break down the complete election results for Marijuana Election Night 2014 here in our 420 Radio News right after this first break. But if you can't wait, you can go to my personal blog at RadicalRust.com where I have posted the most up-to-date information on all 83 races that I could find before airtime today. So you can check that out at RadicalRust.com. We are so, so thrilled here to have passed marijuana legalization in my home state of Oregon and set the table for more full-scale legalization across this country in 2016. It went almost as good as we could have hoped. And I, I appreciate everyone who got the word out and joined us last night on our Marijuana Election Night 2014 coverage. We brought you seven hours of live coverage with all sorts of great guests, and we had thousands of people watching the live stream. And if you were one of them, Thank you so much for your support. We landed a couple more new sponsors for 420radio.org, and that'll help us keep going all the way through 2016. We have got some interviews for you today. Uh, I got to tell you, I'm a little, uh, I'm a little tired. I was up all night last night till 2:30 in the morning, combing through election results, trying to get uh, everything for Alaska and uh, get everything that we needed for uh, the various cities in Michigan and Massachusetts and so forth. And I was just about ready to go to bed. When I got a call from the engineer for the Bill Press show, the number one drive time show in Washington, D.C., asking me to join them at 6.30 Eastern time to discuss the marijuana election results, which, of course, is 3.30 in the morning my time. I stayed up and did that uh, interview. We'll play that for you in hour two, my uh, Washington, D.C. interview earlier this morning on the Bill Press show coming up later. Uh, so I stayed up till about four, caught about three hours of sleep and got back up at seven to do more election updating. So I'm kind of tired. I'm going to try to do as little speaking today as possible and let our guests take the lead. Coming up at half past, we are debuting our brand new segment, Hemp Day Hump Day with Doug Fine, the author of Hemp Bound and Too High to Fail. He'll be joining us every other Wednesday to talk about the emerging hemp industry. And since Oregon also legalized industrial hemp yesterday, I'm sure he's got plenty to say about it. Doug was actually doing door knocking yesterday to get everyone out to the polls, and it really seems to have worked. So can't wait to talk to Doug Fine. Then at uh, 45 past, we're talking with Diane Goldstein from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. She'll break down what went down in California and look forward to legalization in 2016. Then we'll move into hour two, Toker Talk Radio. Like I said, we'll have that uh, Bill Press interview to start things off. We've got an Irie Wednesday daily Toker tune from Gordon Green, bringing us some music from Ocean. And uh, then we've got uh, great interviews. First, we've got Anthony Johnson, the chief petitioner of Measure 91, and Representative Earl Blumenauer. We've got footage from both of them last night at the Measure 91 Victory Party. So we'll play that at about 4.30, about half past in the second hour. And then we've also got uh, their interviews with me uh, on the show uh, from last night, where they Skyped in from their party. We'll play those as well. We've also got a uh, drug war data mining that we'll bring you. We're going to uh, break down uh, what happened with uh, the votes in Florida and why there's some silver linings in there. And in behind the headlines, now that it's legal, when exactly will you be legal to toke and grow in Alaska, Oregon, and Washington, D.C.? We'll break that down for you, too. It's all coming up next on The Russ Belville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. 
420 Radio, turning red states and blue states green. Hey, this is Willie Nelson for Norman. And I smoke pot and I like it a lot. I learned a long time ago that marijuana is a lot safer than alcohol. There's nothing wrong with the responsible use of marijuana by adults. It's time we stopped arresting and started respecting those who smoke marijuana responsibly. To learn what you can do to help, contact Normal at NORML.org or call toll-free 888-67-NORML. Big Daddy Fink's Funky Roller Rink, the best in late 70s soul, funk, and disco. Every Thursday at 5 and 8 Pacific with two-hour replays Friday at 10 p.m. Pacific on 420radio.org. 420radio.org presents the Herb Thrasher Flower Hour with Herb Thrasher and Radical Russ from Portland, Oregon. Herb Thrasher Flower Hour is two hours of unrestrained rock, metal, punk, and alt-country music, interviews, concert bootlegs, and sports with America's hardest-rocking marijuana activist stoner, Herb Thrasher. Live two hours Friday, 8 p.m. Pacific, with replays at 8 and 5 on Fridays and replays Saturday at 8 p.m. Pacific on 420radio.org. It's time for the 420 Radio News, covering the latest headlines in consumer cannabis, medical marijuana, and industrial hemp. Transcripts of 420 Radio News are available daily on our website at 420radio.org. Now, here's Russ Melville with your marijuana headlines in 4 minutes and 20 seconds. This is your 420 Radio News for Wednesday, November 5th, 2014. Legalization goes three for three. Washington, D.C.'s Initiative 71 to legalize the personal possession and cultivation of marijuana crushed all expectations, garnering 69.4% of the vote. Oregon's Measure 91 passed with 55.7% of the vote, making the Pacific Northwest the first legal region in the country and the first shared legalization border in the world. Alaska's Question 2 also passed with 52.1% of the vote and like Oregon will legalize the personal possession and cultivation of marijuana as well as marijuana markets taxed at $35 an ounce in Oregon and $50 an ounce in Alaska. Medical marijuana gets two clear victories, but only one win. Our day started out with the good news that the island territory of Guam, where the sun first rises on the United States, passed its medical marijuana proposal 14A with 56.4% of the vote. Florida overwhelmingly voted for its medical marijuana amendment too, Unfortunately, the Florida constitutional threshold of 60% was just too high a hurdle for the southern state to clear, falling just short at 57.6%. California reduced felonies but really wants to tax medical marijuana. Proposition 47 in California defelonized many low-level crimes, such as possession of personal amounts of any drug. The proposition passed with 58.2% of the vote. At the city and county level, however, voters were voting to tax medical marijuana and keep or enact dispensary bans and medical grow restrictions. Voters in Blythe rejected attacks, and in Santa Ana, they prohibited dispensary bans, and in Shasta County, they repealed medical grow restrictions. Otherwise, every other measure on the ballot did not go reformers' way. Colorado legalized, but now cities want to ban pot shops. Colorado localities fared no better than California. The towns of Red Cliff and Manitou Springs rejected bans on pot shops. All other cities voting on bans accepted them, including the Denver suburb of Lakewood. The towns of Ramah and Hot Sulphur Springs rejected pot taxes. All other cities voting on taxes approved them. Vexingly, the towns of Palisade and Paonia voted to both ban pot shops and tax them. Michigan's unbeaten streak ends. Cities in Michigan had gone 16-0 up until this election in passing charter amendments to decriminalize personal amounts of marijuana. Last night, Claire, Frankfurt, Harrison, Lapeer, and Onaway became the first to reject such an amendment, with Lapeer's rejection decided by just six votes. Those cities all had less than 2,000 total votes, while the six larger cities of Berkeley, Huntington Woods, Mount Pleasant, Pleasant Ridge, Port Huron, and Saginaw all supported decriminalization. 
New Mexico perfect on decrim, Maine splits legalization. The two largest counties in New Mexico voted overwhelmingly to decriminalize marijuana with Bernalillo, or Albuquerque's home county, voting 59.5% and Santa Fe voting a whopping 73.1% in favor. In Maine, South Portland joined neighboring Portland's legalization vote from a year ago, approving legalization of two and a half ounces by a 52.4% vote, but smaller Lewiston rejected legalization with only 45.1% support. Massachusetts sweeps 14 pro-legalization policy questions. Eight districts in Massachusetts voted on non-binding public policy questions that asked whether their state representatives should vote to support tax and regulate policies for marijuana, like alcohol. The results ranged from a low of 69% to a high of 74%. Six Massachusetts House districts went further by polling support for tax and regulate policies for marijuana like common fruits, vegetables, and herbs. Support ranged from a low of 54% to a high of 63%. That's a perfect 14-0 in a midterm election where many of those voters were asked to treat marijuana like tomatoes. The full results of every city, county, district, territory, and state legalization vote are available right now at RadicalRust.com. This has been your 420 Radio News for Wednesday, November 5th, 2014. I'm Russ Belville. Four twenty radio. Tune in, turn on, get high, Lee Educated. 420radio.org presents Gordon Green's Music Planet from Barcelona, Spain. Gordon Green has been traveling the world for more than 20 years, discovering and collecting great music along the way. His mix of eclectic sounds from around the globe prove that you don't have to understand the words to enjoy the music. Check out the show every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time with replays Wednesday at 5 and 8 Pacific on 420radio.org. Tokers, there's no good reason to get your dog stoned. While it might not harm them physically, Imagine being a dog who already begs for treats all day, and then imagine that dog having the munchies. Not cool. There's so much I worry about as a mom. Stephen Harper thinks that organized crime should continue to profit from marijuana prohibition. Imagine regulating marijuana like alcohol and cigarettes with a strong and clear educational message, making it more difficult for my kids and your kids to access. Drug dealers don't ask for ID. Stephen Harper does not have the kind of judgment we need to protect our children, authorized by the Normal Women's Alliance of Canada. Welcome back, everyone. 13 after the hour. And in Behind the Headlines, we ask, we won the election. Now when can we smoke and grow legally? The marijuana midterms are over and legalization efforts went three for three, including Oregon as of press time with 92% of the votes counted, breaking Washington's previous record for legalization support. Measure 91 in Oregon came in with 55.74% of the vote versus 2012 Washington's I-502 posting 55.70% and Colorado's Amendment 64 passing in 2012 with 55.32%. This is significant as experts predicted lower support during the traditionally more conservative, older skewing midterm elections. Furthermore, Oregon set this record without the compromises of per se DUID levels and no home grow that helped Washington pass and the absurdly high tax rates both Colorado and Washington used to sell legalization to reluctant voters. Alaska came in with 52.15% as well, like Oregon, including a tax and regulate scheme with low per, se ounce, or low per ounce taxation rather than sales and excise taxes and omitting any per se DUID limit. Washington, D.C. knocked it out of the park with 69.45%, but that initiative doesn't include a marijuana retail system, only home grow and possession. So, when do you book your sativa sightseeing tour of Seaside, Oregon? or your daylight dabbing in Denali, Alaska, or your white widow walkabout in Washington, D.C.? Well, not quite yet. It's been voted to be legal, but you still have to wait some time before it is actually legal. In Oregon, the law goes into effect 30 days from the vote, or December 4th. But confusingly, that doesn't mean you're legal to smoke and grow pot yet. That's just the date that the state can begin working to create the rules for the legal marijuana marketplace. On July 1st, 2015 is when the personal possession of an ounce in public 
eight ounces and four plants at home, a pound of medicated edibles, a six pack or 72 ounces of medicated, uh, medicated liquids becomes legal July 1st, 2015. While an ounce of hash oil is also made legal on that date, that's only if it's purchased from a licensed retail outlet. Those retail outlets, as well as producers, processors, and wholesalers, can't even begin submitting their applications to the state until January 4th, 2016. So it will not be until spring 2016 at the earliest, after the first harvest, or perhaps later if the applications are delayed, before you can buy legal weed in Oregon. In Alaska, their legalization goes into effect 90 days after the election is certified, which should be sometime near the end of February 2015. At that time, personal possession of an ounce of marijuana in public and six plants at home, and only three of them being mature, will be legal in Alaska, probably around February 2015, as well as the possession of all the results of one's harvests in the home. And, and note the plurals there, <laughs> all the results of one's harvests. However, 1975's Raven Alaska Supreme Court decision already grants the privacy right to having up to a quarter pound and 25 plants in the home. So this victory doesn't change much for Alaskans in that regard. But by nine months after the effective date, anticipated to be in mid-September 2015, the state must have rules in place for licensing marijuana establishments. And again, it will take harvest time and any unforeseen licensing delays before it's legal to buy weed in Alaska, probably around the end of 2015 or the beginning of 2016. Washington, D.C., on the other hand, is harder to predict because all laws passed there are subject to the approval of Congress, which has 30 days to review the initiative. But there aren't 30 congressional working days between now and the beginning of the next Congress. So D.C. is not even going to submit it for review until mid-January 2015. That means by late February or early March 2015, and assuming Congress doesn't move to block the law, possessing up to two ounces of marijuana and cultivating up to six plants at home, again, only three of them being mature, will be legal, probably beginning of March 2015. However, sales will remain illegal until the D.C. City Council moves to create a tax and regulate plan for the district, which is already forecasted to happen. That, too, will be subject to a review by Congress, so we probably won't see any D.C. pot shops until 2016 at the earliest. And remember one important thing. None of these places, or Colorado and Washington for that matter, have legalized public consumption of marijuana. Now that we've legalized, we need to set a good example so the states where passing legalization will be tougher can't use civil disobedience against public consumption bans against their own activists. And we've got a good look at what's coming up for 2016. I personally think it's a great idea that these states have put so much delay into the promulgation of rules at these states. Uh, we saw what happened with Washington and Colorado, Washington not licensing enough growers, having all sorts of problems with supply, Colorado having to deal on the fly with the edible situation and the, the, the marketing and the packaging of those products. Giving Oregon and Alaska till 2016 to be able to work these things out with public meetings and committees to determine what the best rules are and how they can learn from Colorado and Washington is only going to make our legalization even that much better. We'll continue to see the results that come out from uh, Colorado and Washington. We'll be able to use those in our campaigns as we move into 2016 in most likely California, Arizona, Nevada, Maine, possibly Massachusetts, Vermont, Rhode Island. There's many, many prizes on the table for 2016. But when we have our legalization worked out and it starts to become a reality in early 2016, that's just going to make things so much easier for us when we're talking about uh, proposing these in other states, especially some of the more conservative or reluctant states. We'll have all the time to get our act together, to put our best foot forward, and as we get toward election season 2016, they'll get to see even better results coming out of Oregon, Alaska, and Washington, D.C.
Looking forward to it. From now on, you will speak only when spoken to. <laughs> sir, yes, sir. Hey, everyone. It's 420 in the Mountain Time Zone. Happy 420 to our friends in Denver, Colorado. And uh, also in New Mexico, where in Albuquerque and Santa Fe, they have passed overwhelmingly the measures to decriminalize marijuana. We're spreading all throughout the West, and we're bringing this freedom to you in the East and the South. It's going to come to you faster than you think. Stay tuned. We're right back with Florida after this. 420 Radio, the world's voice of marijuana legalization. Are you a hypocrite? If you live a closeted cannabis lifestyle, you are. Read about seven people living a closeted cannabis lifestyle who are on the verge of coming out in The Hypocrites by Mara K. Eaton. Available at areyouahypocrite.net. You can purchase the book on Amazon and Barnes & Noble, also available on iTunes. Check out Mara K. Eaton on Facebook as well. Learn more at areyouahypocrite.net. Drug Truth Network Century of Lies with Dean Becker from Houston, Texas. Replaying Mondays at 11 Pacific on 420radio.org. At Herbie's Cannabis Seeds, we pride ourselves on bringing you the best quality seeds from the world's most respected cannabis seed producers, all at the lowest online prices. You can find Herbie's Seeds at Herbie'sHeadShop.com. All cannabis seeds are sold as souvenirs and as a means of preserving cannabis genetics. Herbie's Seeds in no way intends to condone, promote, or incite the use of illegal or controlled substances. We strongly urge all prospective customers to check their national laws prior to placing an order. Herbie's Seeds at Herbie'sHeadShop.com. Proud sponsors of The Russ Belville Show and 420 Radio. Arguing for the end of adult marijuana prohibition is easy because we have facts, science, reason, compassion, evidence, truth, and logic on our side. It is even easier when researchers catalog it all for us. Learn how to gather the facts on marijuana use, arrests, seizures, rehabs, drug tests, and more in this edition of Drug War Data Mining. Welcome back, everyone. And scanning over the election results from last night, the one sad point for everyone watching our seven-hour coverage was the returns from Florida, where they came in with only 57.6% of the vote. Anywhere else in the nation, this would be considered a slam dunk. And in fact, that 57.6% vote for medical marijuana in Florida is greater than the votes were in Oregon, California, or Colorado, among others. So they... The people there that are really bummed out about this not passing, I understand that. But really, from my perspective, Florida was a huge victory last night. And only the technicality of the Florida Constitution is keeping people from medical marijuana at this point. The legislators in Florida have gotten the message that there is a huge and widespread support for access to medical marijuana in the state. And mark my words, in 2016, there will be medical marijuana winning in the election in Florida. There's too much money that wants to make it happen. There are too many seniors in Florida that make want to make this happen. I feel if they come out with better language, uh, a better front man for the, the campaign and get more patient stories in front of the people, we will see medical marijuana in Florida. Medical, mar or medical marijuana in Florida, I've, I've composed some of the numbers here. This is a breakdown by counties. All the county votes in Florida. And as you can see, there were a number of counties here, uh, nine counties in Florida, that would have passed the constitutional amendment that got over 60% of the vote. And some of these counties, we're talking hundreds of thousands of people, uh, almost uh, half a million in Broward County. We're talking about, uh, let's see, uh, uh, 443,000 votes in Broward and 403 in Palm Beach and 350,000 in Pinellas County and great margins of victory from 24% to 43% margins. That will not be lost on the lawmakers in Florida. As we scroll down, we can find out as well that there were many counties that were in the majority, even if they didn't break that 60%. Uh, in this respect, we're looking at how many of these counties coming in at... Above 50, there's 42 counties that came in above 
Then looking at the counties that did not pass that were below 50%, uh, we have 16 of them with uh, ranges between uh, 0.04% down to uh, 20% in the range of victory. So much greater margins of victory among the counties that supported it than margins of defeat in the counties that opposed it. This, again, shows great support for medical marijuana moving forward in Florida. In fact, looking at the totals here, we have got 3.3 million votes for medical marijuana versus 2.4 million against. Again, that 57.6% uh, victory means a 15% margin. And that is something that will catch any politician's attention. Any issue, there's a 15% margin. The uh, averages are here listed here as well, where we can see how many votes there were. And really, in the counties where it got less than a majority, it worked out to about 1,833 votes per county that kept it at less than a majority. So there's much to look at at Florida. These votes for medical marijuana, these 3.3 million votes, are more votes than Governor Rick Scott got for his reelection, more than uh, Pam Bondi got for her attorney general reelection and are more than were achieved in any of the statewide Florida elections. More people voted for marijuana than voted for any statewide candidate. And once again, that can't be lost on these politicians. They are going to pay attention to those numbers. That's the kind of stuff they want to see. So folks in Florida, don't despair. You just suffered what I would consider your Oregon 2012 moment. In Oregon, we wanted to pass legalization, but our language was wide open, way too wide open, too easy for our critics to attack. And the front man of our messaging for the campaign in 2012 was someone who'd had a shady business past and uh, was easily attacked uh, by the members of the media and our opponents. Likewise, in Florida, you got language that was really wide open uh, having the California clause where doctors could recommend for any condition they feel marijuana would help. And you had a front man in John Morgan, who is a personal injury attorney, which doesn't always engender the best stereotypes, who then was caught in a drunken tirade going off about passing medical marijuana. And uh, that did not do well for the campaign as well uh, either. 2016 will be much better. Trust me. You can get 420 Radio on the go with our Shoutcast stream for all internet-enabled media players. Go to rad-r.us slash 420shout or just click the Shoutcast icon below the live radio feed at 420radio.org. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, treat law enforcement with respect and stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all of my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent and I want to speak with my attorney. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at omarfigueroa.com. Georgia. Hi, this is Willie Nelson. Alcohol prohibition didn't work in the 1920s, and marijuana prohibition isn't working today. It's time we stopped arresting responsible marijuana smokers. It's the fair thing to do. For more information, contact Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Call toll free 888 67 N O R M L or visit their website at norml.org. You know Herb Thrasher from the Herb Thrasher Flower Hour. Now get ready for Herb Age Designs for the proud cannabis consumer. Herb Age Designs, lifestyle gear for the 420 friendly. Herb Age Designs, we've got frisbee golf discs and durable hemp gear. Herb Age Designs, we've got shot glasses, drinking glasses, coffee mugs, and beer cozies. Check us out on Facebook and online at HerbAgeDesigns.com and follow Herb Age and Herb Thrasher on Twitter. The cannabis community is a diverse set of people from all walks of life, conservative and liberal, black and white, straight and gay, rich and poor, and everyone in between. Learn more about the people we are freeing from adult marijuana prohibition in our cannabis community chat. All right, welcome back, everybody. It's uh, 30 after the hour time for our 
cannabis community chat, which is actually going to be a new segment entitled Hemp Day Hump Day. And uh, it's our segment featuring Doug Fine, who's the author of this great book, Hemp Bound, Dispatches from the Front Line of the Next Agricultural Revolution. We're dialing out to Doug right now, having a little bit of difficulty getting him on the phone line, but uh, should be connected to us anytime. Doug also is the author of Too High to Fail, which is a New York Times bestseller. And uh, he was a part of the Measure 91 campaign, working hard to end marijuana prohibition here successfully. He was uh, a part of the uh, Get Out the Vote campaign and was door knocking even on the last day throughout Oregon, came up uh, up to Portland to help get the vote out for our Measure 91 campaign. We're having a little difficulty getting Doug on the line. Let me give you a little bit of music until we can... Uh, uh, Find Doug will return right as soon as we can. Think about the happy little things, though, it's a boogie all the time. I'm going, a boogie boogie, I'm going, a boogie boogie, I'm going, a boogie boogie, I'm going. All right, so sorry, folks. We are just not able to get Doug Fine on the phone, so we're going to have to adjust the schedule a little bit. Going to pull up the interviews that we were scheduled for in hour two, Toku Talk Radio. This is uh, this is my interview on the Bill Press Show from earlier this morning, uh, really early this morning, my time, and uh, we spoke with uh, Bill Press, the number one drive time liberal show in Washington D.C. show. All right, here we go at 33 minutes after the hour, uh, trying to probe and uh, figure out what went wrong and uh, how we recover and where we go from here. Again, you can't get away from it. Uh, there's just something about the midterms that the Democratic base just doesn't get it, don't realize how important they are. Same thing happened in 2010. Uh, young people, minorities stayed home, and we got our ass whipped. And the same thing happens. It's not the only factor, but I'd say it's the number one or two, number two factor. Maybe, I, I don't know what's more important than that or what had more of an impact than that. Uh, your calls and comments welcome at 866-55-PRESS. It was a wipeout, let's face it, in the Senate races, in the governor's races. Uh, a little bit of good news in the initiative races. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, pot in just a second, but... Uh, Let's start out with uh, Beverly from St. David, Illinois. Hello, Beverly. Uh, I'm not going to say good morning either because uh, uh, I'm stuck under a billionaire in Illinois. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, again, I really thought Pat Quinn was going to pull out. Dick Durbin got reelected, right? Good for him. But. Well, Dick Durbin is beloved here in this state, but that's not the point. Uh, I have said all along what was going to happen. This was a protest voice vote against a black man in the White House. And until people believe that, we are screwed. 
Well, uh, certainly uh, the Republicans were successfully, Beverly, able to uh, make Barack Obama, even though he wasn't on the ballot, to make him the focus of uh, many Senate races and even governor's races. Scott Walker last night was talking about how bad Obama is. I mean, what the hell does that have to do with the Wisconsin governor's race? Uh, but they used the, they used that uh, tool and they used it successfully. I mentioned some. Um, Bright spots on the initiative front, particularly on pot. And if you're talking pot, there's nobody better to talk to about it than our good friend, Russ Belleville. He's been a uh, guest host here on the Bill Press Show and a guest many times. He himself is a radio talk show host and a marijuana reform activist out in uh, Seattle, Washington. Radical Russ, we call him. Uh, hey, Ra- hey, Russ, how are you this morning? Hey, Bill, it's great to be back. I'm in Portland, Oregon, actually, oh, and it's oh, Portland. All right, it's like going full circle here. I remember uh, talking to you in 2006 at 3 a.m. my time for the uh, contest. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a great time right. to be back. I don't know how I forgot you're in Portland, but um, uh, but yeah, I love There's a lot of changes since then. I yeah, uh-huh. marijuana. I love Portland. So, uh, Oregon, big state last night with Alaska and District of Columbia. Tell us about it. Well, yeah, uh, I know it's been kind of a a sad day for Democrats all across the country, but for those of us in marijuana reform, this is our best election ever. Uh, We were three for three in legalization in Washington, D.C., Oregon, and Alaska. So, and and D.C., you guys nearly passed it with 70%. That was pretty amazing. Uh, now, what? So, is this the same in Oregon? Let's start in Oregon. Is this the same as Colorado and Washington State? It's better. We have the uh, the distinct oh. advantage of getting to go second in the in the marijuana votes uh, and getting to learn from the mistakes of Colorado and Washington. Uh, we decided not to overtax our marijuana to uh, try to bring it better in control and and reduce the chances of having black marketeers trying to undercut that tax. We learned some better regulatory schemes. Uh, we got some better language and we did not include... You put your did not include some of the uh, the bad parts of the laws that got included in Washington and Colorado, such as uh, DUID provisions and uh, mm-hmm. a restriction on home growing. We will be allowed to grow our own plants here in Oregon. Whoa! So that's uh, Washington State and Oregon. We're gonna we're gonna join you in California here one of these days, Russ. You that, know we, that is the big the talk. Th- that is I the big. We- Oh, but sorry. That, right. I was just saying that's the uh, big prize everyone's looking at for 2016. And now with this uh, momentum of three going three for three in this election, uh, it does seem pretty inevitable that California will have to join us here on the West Coast with the whole rest of the West Coast is uh, is completely legal. And we got British Columbia surrounded. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, I have uh, let me tell you, I will take it as a personal responsibility to work on my friend Jerry Brown. Oh, please. Uh, I know because he's been a little reluctant here, but. We could be, we could win without Jerry Brown. I just I'll just have to work on him personally, right? No, we could uh, definitely use that help. And then Alaska is is sort of along the same as uh, the line as uh, as the Oregon measure. Uh, somewhat, uh, we're really proud of Alaska passing, making it the first you know red state to have passed sensible marijuana reforms. Good uh, point. Oregon passed with fifty four percent. Alaska came in with fifty two percent, but uh, very similar there in in the votes. And and we're happy to welcome them uh, into the legal world with us and Colorado and Washington. So one of the things in uh, Colorado, especially, is pot tourism, right? People could travel there, they could go there, they could walk sure. into a pot shop, they could buy it. That's not going to be the case with, like, Washington, D.C. now, right? No. Uh, Washington, D.C. is a special case in that you legalize the personal possession and cultivation, but the way the district's laws are set up, you can't put taxation and those kind of things on the initiative ballot. The D.C. City Council is going to look at creating a regulated marketplace for marijuana, but really all that you guys just voted for is essentially the personal use and growing of marijuana. Right. You know, a lot of people want it, yeah. Yeah, but th- there's a little wrinkle there. Which you're alluding to, is, it, as I understand it, you can possess it, but you can't sell it. Correct. Right? Correct. Yeah. It would still yeah, be a crime grow, to sell. It, yeah. So where do you get it? Uh, you have to wait for the weed Get fairy to stop here. by. <laughs> <Get> resources, <Russ. laughs> so uh, what's next? Uh, by the way, 
are these the only three that were on oh the no uh, last night we had the most marijuana votes of any election in american history there were 83 different states territories districts cities and counties voting on marijuana legalization uh some of the, the results included the beginning of our day uh polls closed at 5 a.m yesterday uh with guam the territory of guam passing its medical marijuana proposal uh, in Florida, they narrowly missed passing medical marijuana, but it was a landslide victory. It passed with 57% of the vote, but in Florida, you need 60% to pass that kind of constitutional oh, amendment. Wow. It, oh, wow. it is pretty interesting, though, that not one county, not a single county in Florida voted against medical marijuana. They all came in over 50%. Even Sewanee County, it came in at 50.02%, literally five votes in favor. Five more votes decided that county. Oh, my God. And Guam. Talk about pot tourism. Wow. Well, it, it is a great day, and, and um, it, it would have been good news any day, but particularly good news <laughs> yesterday, given what happened with the rest of the country and all the other races. Yeah, so we're uh, good work out there. You've, um, you and... Uh, your good friends like Alan St. Pierre here in Washington have uh, have made a uh, have made a great difference, moving in the right direction. Radicalrust.com is Russ Belleville's website. You can follow him and all the good work of the medical re- marijuana reform activists. Radicalrust.com. Hey, Russ, good to talk to you as always. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thank you, Bill. And folks, if you uh, are down because the Republicans took control of the Senate, now in some places you can smoke some legal weed to get over it. That's right. All right. Thanks, Russ. Talk to you again. All right. Thank you so much, Bill. There he is. Good fun talking to Bill Press and Peter Ogburn out there in Washington, D.C. Bill Press is partially responsible for me talking to you right now. Back in 2006, I was in a talk radio contest, a national contest, and Bill Press's show was where the contest played out. So I got to meet Bill, go to Washington, D.C., work in the studio with Peter and so forth. That was eight years ago, man. I can't believe it's been that long. But uh, thanks to Bill Press for having me on. Hope I get a chance, maybe over the uh, holiday weekend again, to co-host or to uh, guest host his show. That was a lot of fun. All right. Stay tuned. When we come back, we have got Diane Goldstein from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition and her take on Marijuana Election Night 2014. You're listening to The Russ Bell Show on 420radio.org. You're tuned into The Russ Bell Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. You can get 420 Radio on the go with the TuneIn Radio app for all mobile platforms. Go to rad-r.us slash 420 TuneIn or just click the TuneIn Radio icon below the live radio feed on 420radio.org. At Royal Queen Seeds, we've got premium feminized cannabis seeds, including auto-flowering varieties for the medical cannabis user. We've got bulk shipments available and new CBD oil. Plus, we accept payment in Visa, MasterCard, and Bitcoin, as well as other methods. Check out our website at royalqueenseeds.com for more information. We are located in the Netherlands, and we have online grow experts ready to help you now at royalqueenseeds.com. In the interest of fair and balanced journalism, the Russ Belville Show presents the anti-drug public service announcement of the day. Serenity Lane's Dr. Ronald Schwartzler for the No on Measure 91 campaign tells how marijuana kills infants. I would like to uh, uh, concentrate on the, those edibles. There have been five infant children deaths in Colorado that have picked up these uh, drugs uh, from gummy bears, fruity pebbles, what five young infants have died. Now, if that's not catastrophic, I don't know what is. If you lose an infant child. Three out of five adults in Oregon rehabs who were flagged for marijuana were referred by the criminal justice system. Only one in five chooses to go to rehab. There are more adults coerced into rehab by drug courts and the criminal justice system for marijuana than all cocaine and heroin users in rehab combined. Adults forced into rehab by the criminal justice system are more than one out of five of all adults in rehab. 
Yet they say we don't have enough drug treatment space for hard drug users who really need it. Measure 91 dedicates 25% of marijuana tax revenues to drug treatment, prevention, and mental health programs. It also opens up thousands of treatment beds by removing adult marijuana users whose only problem with marijuana was getting caught. Vote yes on Measure 91. This advertisement produced by the Russ Melville Show and is not sponsored or endorsed by the Yes on 91 campaign. This has been the anti-drug public service announcement of the day. To cure this sort of reefer madness, listen to the Russ Belville Show every weekday on 420 Radio. The pistachio. Green, natural, and available without prescription in all 50 states. He's fine. One of the most disturbing elements of the Prohibition War is how it's made police the enemy of otherwise law-abiding cannabis consumers. Fortunately, one group of police officers knows the futility of Prohibition and reaches out to educate the community and current law enforcement. Today, the Russ Belleville Show visits with another speaker from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition with one clear message. Cops legalized drugs. All right, welcome back, everybody. 46 after the hour, and we're joined by Diane Goldstein, one of the board members of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition and uh, someone who I know was celebrating last night's victory in California. Hi, Diane. Hey, Russ. A virtual high five. High five. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> you know, let me tell you, I think, uh, first of all, sorry that I missed the call last night. It is uh, I uh, was up at uh, Russian Times News and then went down to Santa Ana um, to uh, to. We were hoping that uh, the Santa Ana Measure CC would pass. It did not. The mm. the city of Santa Ana BB passed, but they still did a very very hard fought fight. But unbelievable victories for drug policy reformers last night across our nation from Guam to uh, even Florida despite it being a loss it's a mandate and it's and it shows the power or the the uh, the lack of power that law enforcement is finally starting uh, to have is we are stripping away at their influence and their um, uh, their lobbying and their lies and their omissions. And I think that's what's so important about everything that happened last night. It, we're seeing the waning of law enforcement crony capitalism, and we need to continue to push that fight and push that fight until they're defanged, quite frankly. Yeah, I know the only major support uh, for the anti-legalization campaign here in Oregon was the Sheriffs and the Narcotics Officers Association who contributed it over 95% of the funds uh, to that campaign. Same was uh, ha happened up in Alaska. I know Florida, the sheriffs were against the medical marijuana there. And I'm sure in California, they weren't too happy about this Prop 47 or, or was there most opposition to that? Oh, no, it literally is... Every single law enforcement agency, with the exception of the California Correctional Peace Officers Association, was opposed to Prop 47. Um, and it was interesting, though, is the funding that came from it was mostly law enforcement. Um, the, the biggest contributor was PORAC, which is a more of a collective bargaining um, union and not necessarily, you know, even though they have a lobbyist, um, they've been pretty drug policy reform friendly. They put in like $285,000. The California narcotics officers put in money. But interesting enough, the California police chiefs only put in 5000 because I think they saw that the writing was on the wall and they, they didn't want to waste money. But what's interesting is if you go to their press releases is, I mean, they're pouting like little children. Instead of taking this as an opportunity to reach out to people in the community and say, you know what, it's clear that the public has changed their mind about what public safety should be doing. 
So let's bridge the gap and let's become stakeholders and consensus builders and work to do what's best, not for law enforcement, but for the people that we serve. And I think that's the critical message that I'm going to be pounding on in the, in the next couple of weeks. I'm getting to write an article literally for California that talks about how we have stripped them of power in the last three years, um, you know, obviously California, uh, Prop 47. This last year, LEAP and other drug policy reform organizations killed a badly flawed Senate bill that was introduced by the California police chiefs and by the California League of Cities to overly to be overly restrictive to regulate medical marijuana. We managed to kill that. We've killed three zero tolerance DUID bills that they've introduced. And so we're picking away at their power. And yet we we have reached out across the table and said, look, work with us. Kind of like Kevin Sabet. <laughs> You know, it's like work with us to develop what is responsible policies because, you know, at the end of the day, none of us want, including drug policy reformers, our kids to have access to marijuana. It's how we view the drug itself and how we view harm reduction and the failure of the war on drugs. And so I think that's one of the things that LEAP has been really, really critical about and, and our collaborations with, with you and with, you know, the Drug Policy Alliance and with every major organization that is helping to turn the tide is really significant. It just shows the strength in numbers. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful uh, development that's been a, a great welcome to the drug policy reform movement is having cops on our side, having prosecutors on our side who can speak truth to power on this. And uh, you mentioned Kevin Sabet. It's funny, someone in, uh, I assume Boston, because he's got Beantown in his name, uh, was talking about Kevin Sabet trying to spin Florida as a giant victory for them and using the David and Goliath line again. He spent so much time around those sheriffs, he's learned the stop resisting strategy. <laughs> you know what, guys? God, boy, isn't that the truth? Because it's really interesting is if you look at Florida, you know, we can talk about pros and cons about how their campaign occurred and what happened and, you know, strategy and lessons learned. And I think 2016, they'll be back and they'll win. Yeah. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And I think that they're going to be more collaborative with other drug policy organizations uh, because they'll, you know, I think that that they'll know is what we need is we needed Neil Franklin sitting there mm -hmm. debating the sheriff instead of John Morgan. John Morgan's good in certain places, but he shouldn't have been everything about the campaign. You know, there should have been patients and, and more doctors and, you know, other people that were policy people that I think could have really made a it would have it would have made up for those three percent points. Yeah. And and Sabet is so interesting to spin that in that fashion. I mean, I think his quote was we've slowed the freight train of legalization down. And and it was like, wow, is that comedic relief? Yeah. Yeah. Really do you really do you have any concern that is Sheldon Adelson in an article and I can't remember where this article was has stated that he is going to put his money where his mouth is in the next couple years. Yeah. And so he is going to be the funder for the anti-movement. And so what we need to do with drug policy reformers, with marijuana activists, and, and you know, the problem has been is they haven't been known to um, donate to legalization efforts or to initiative effort efforts as much. You know, maybe Oregon was a little bit different this year. But in California is they have it. And so if California is going to win in 2016, we need the cannabis industry and we need individual activists to give us money. And, and even if it's ten dollars, even if it's four twenty a month, is we're gonna need somewhere between fifteen to eighteen million dollars for California to to win. Yeah. And it's a and it's a big deal. Yeah. And if these businesses want to expand, they need more consumers and they need that market of California to open up. And, you know, Diane, I got to say, if uh, if Kevin Sabet's crowing about a victory where he has a 15 point margin and that was after spending four million dollars the first time there was ever a negative ad campaign against medical marijuana in a southern state during a midterm election. Yeah. Hell, I'll take that any day. 
Oh, you know, absolutely. And, 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 I, and I think what we all know is if, if they would have filed not in a constitutional amendment, it would have been an overwhelming victory. And, you know, I hate to say this, but, you know, we can look at the demographics of all the exit polls and, that came out. Is every demographic except for the 65 and older overwhelmingly voted 60 percent for uh, medical marijuana in Florida? And, you know, I've, I've said this, and, I, you know, I'm not wishing ill on anyone in any way, shape, or form, but in the next, you know, two to four years, that demo demographic is dying off. Mm -hmm. And even conservative Republicans that are younger are much more libertarian thinking, and they support blowing up the drug war. And so, you know, it, it's it's... I think we're going to make progress quicker than we thought. And then, you know, the other issue is also the evidentiary hearing that happened in, in California. Oh, yes. You know, so let's see what happens with that, because if we can at least get, you know, the federal government, a federal judge to say marijuana should not be on the schedule one, that'll help us perpetuate this momentum and continue to, you know, try and kept rolling all night long, <laughs> you know, it's, and, and it's happening. Yeah. And um, I think people are just sick and tired and fed up of politics. And they're sick and tired of being lied to by politicians and, and by people in charge, or at least relative to the drug war, because, you know, the elections last night were very interesting is, you know, the Republicans upended the Senate and the House, and yet we overwhelmingly voted in marijuana mm -hmm. and, and, and rolled back. I mean, that's the beauty of Prop 47 is it's the first state to actually roll back the laws. There are, I believe it's like 12 or 13 other states that have the same, um, the same law, you know, but nobody has ever rolled back mass incarceration like this. And it's, you know, the, the chiefs and the narcotics officers and Porak and everybody else are sitting back going, you know, we're so horrible, horrified that the uh, election occurred like this and it's out of state money that isn't going to be here to pick up the pieces of, you know, death and devastation that's going to be caused by this. And yet, we know in the 13 other states that crime has not gone up because of this. And it's the same thing with marijuana. It's the same thing with, you know, access to naloxone. And, and, you know, we're slowly but surely, I think, going to win this. And, and we're going to win it because of alternative media, not because of mainstream media. Because, it, you know, and I was on RT News last night. We were having that conversation if it wasn't for people like you and grassroots activists and alternate and alternative media that we've managed to spring up because of technology and the internet, um, I don't think we'd be at the place where, where we are now. Hmm. And um, that's going to be something that's going to continue to drive the locomotive. And it's, it's funny now because you guys are driving media instead of mainstream media driving us. That's so, wonderful. So, I have to ask you something. What's next on, you know, the dollars for disgrace campaign up in Oregon? <laughs> Still raising some funds to hire the lawyers that would have to take us to the the uh, lawsuits. Yeah. I'm at a roadblock where the the arbiter of whether or not I can challenge the release of district attorney records in a county is the district attorney in a county. So that has to go to court. I have to I have to take that to court. But before we go, we uh, just have to wrap up here. I want to remind everyone, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, check them out at leap.cc. You can get great speakers like Diane Goldstein and others to come to your events and tell people the truth from a cop's perspective on why we need to legalize drugs. Congratulations on Prop 47, defelonizing possession and other low-level crimes. And I understand there's also a retroactive release part of this. Can you give us that in maybe 20, 30 seconds? Yeah, yeah literally the only thing that it does is it allows people to petition the court to take a look at their case and see if um, they can basically get out earlier than, than um, anticipated. Hmm. And so that's, you know, and it, that's going to be a long process as well because there's a lot of different things that come into it that they're going to look at people's criminal history and make 
make certain that they're not releasing offenders that are in fact violent. All right. So very well done initiative. Congratulations. Very well done in Oregon. I'm thrilled about Alaska and it's been a good it's been a good day. All right. Thank you, Diane Goldstein, board member of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. That's all the time we got. I'm Radical Russ. Until next time, take care of each other, tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. Stay tuned. Hour two is next. We've got speeches from the Measure 91 campaign party. You can only catch them here on Toker Talk Radio.